Well, welcome everyone to this Open Group webinar, uh, which today I'm very pleased to say has been brought to us uh, to our friend at Evolution. And um, before I hand over to our speakers today, Tim and Andrew, I'd just like to go over a few housekeeping issues to keep the event moving forward smoothly. Firstly, with regards to questions, and of course, we would encourage you to uh, ask some questions today. Uh, the best way to do that is to write your question into the text QA facility. Uh, if you write a question in there, can I ask you to address it to all or all participants? That way everyone gets to see all the questions are being submitted. And our intention is to try and answer as many questions as we can today at the end of today's presentation. If you'd like to simply share a comment uh, with a fellow attendee, um, then the best way to do that is in the chat facility. Now, today's event is being fully recorded. So if for any reason you have to leave early, or if you experience any local technical difficulties, and I know that sometimes the audio can be a little problematical, then everyone who has registered for today's event will get an email with the appropriate link where they can access that recording. So Tim and Andrew, if you're ready to go, can I ask you to start today's presentation? Yeah, thanks, Simon. Um, OK, so some of you have heard already. So um, I'm Tim O'Neill. Um, so I'm going to sort of kick off things um, today. And I've got my colleague Andrew with me. Um, I think the next slide gives us a bit of a um, agenda and then a bit of a bio, so I'll leave it to them to, to sort of formally introduce ourselves. But um, so today, obviously, we're going to be looking at no-code algorithms with a particular focus on how they can support road mapping in enterprise architecture. Um, so we'll give some sort of background on, on roadmaps in general, um, some of the sort of different uh, ways that they're defined, the ways that the standards talk about them and give us guidance on how we can do those. Um, yep, then we'll, we'll put a, a no-code flavor on them. So these um, roadmaps aren't just you know, pretty pictures. They actually have some science behind them, some numbers, um, some numbers that we can trust, um, needed to say things that we can make decisions with. Um, we'll go through a few different techniques. Um, so we sort of identify four different approaches to doing road mapping, and we'll go through that. And then we'll sort of turn it into a bit more of a pragmatic um, guidance and sort of you know, give, you, give you hopefully the, the kind of next steps or the you know, where do you go now after um, we've given you some sort of guidance. And you know, it's not a Friday, but you know, kind of what you could be doing on Monday morning now to, to start to put this in practice. Um, okay, so yep, Andrew and I are both from Evolution. Um, I've been with the company for um, since it started now, so so certainly um, 20 years, and I've been doing enterprise architecture uh, longer than that. Um, I, I guess it's it's not a photo of me, but you can sort of see I'm the, the guy on the top left there. Um, looks like I don't have too much hair. Um, yeah, it's kind of accurate, but either way. Um, I've got certainly the battle scars that you'd expect to have from being in this industry for this long. Um, I've certainly been on, on many major projects that have been successful. I've been on many major projects that have failed too. Um, and that's, I guess, the, the, the world that we live in. You, you learn from your failures as much as your successes. Um, I guess, Andrew, I'll leave you to introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Andrew Luthwaite. Um, I work as a consultant for Evolution. Um, you can quickly see in the Short, kind of short bio there that I've worked across um, various industries as well. So the idea is to try and pull back some of the common things we've found across those industries into some kind of overarching view of how we're actually supporting road mapping um, using no code throughout the rest of the slides today as well. Great. Thanks, Andrew. OK. so. Let's sort of just a bit of a positioning statement on road mapping. Now, um, we'll go into this in more detail, of course, but um, road maps mean many things to many people. Um, ultimately, a road map has some objective, um, what we like to talk about as a mission. So it's some problem you're trying to solve. Okay, fundamentally, um, a road map is some guidance for you. Um, so depending on what the problems you're trying to address, you might be trying to manage cost or efficiency and look at how you can um, optimize those. You might be looking at how you can improve the security of your enterprise or minimize the risks, increase compliance. Um, ultimately, roadmaps can be used to merge two companies together. Um, I've been in some pretty big um, M&A um, situations where, yeah, we've taken multi-billion dollar companies and sort of mashed them together using architectural techniques to, to manage the synergy savings and, and understand all that. 
and ultimately looking at how you might want to exploit and leverage any innovative stuff that's coming. Now, of course, we practice what we preach, which is fundamentally why we've got this webinar here today. So, so Evolution, the company that we work for, um, applies all of these techniques to themselves. So we have a whole innovation program and ideation as well. And so certainly no code is something that we've been working with, algorithms in general, and then making them um, you know, easy for everyone to do is something we've been working on for many years. Um, so I guess we're starting to, to communicate that out to you guys and show you some of the successes that we've had with our clients and obviously um, hope that you guys can start to you know, learn some things and potentially adopt these sort of practices yourselves. Okay, uh, next one. Um, yeah, look, I mean, what is a roadmap? I mean, fundamentally, um, it means many things to many people. Um, I'll show you some of the definitions that are there in, in some of the standards like TOGAF and Archimate in a second. Um, the one thing that people basically agree um, a roadmap should be or the context that a roadmap should have is some aspect of time. That's really it. Um, there's not too much more consensus after that. But fundamentally, if you're talking about some future or some concept of how things change over time, I think you can safely say that you're talking about a roadmap. Now, obviously, those changes over time should hopefully have some benefit. Um, otherwise, you're really just showing what the, you know, the, the kind of roadmap into, into the abyss might be, which no one wants to do. Um, but fundamentally, showing how things change over time and how potentially something is better than it is today. That's really all a roadmap is, and it's really about all anyone can agree. Now the dimensions to those roadmaps and the way that um, your, the stories you're trying to tell and the missions you're trying to solve, we take a particular metrics based approach to that. So we've all heard of the non-functional requirements or the illities or the KPIs. So the different ways that you're able to hopefully quantitatively and objectively reason about how something is better than something else. And of course, you know, in the future, we're hoping to optimize maybe our performance or maybe our risk or something like that. It's, it's talking about them from a performance basis. Now, there's a fair bit of, um, dare I say, debate over the difference between a life cycle and a roadmap. So certainly life cycles is, is in this world. You know, a life cycle fundamentally has a when concept to it though. So it's always, um, time is not necessarily being explicit. You're not necessarily saying when something is going to happen. Okay, so a roadmap doesn't still, still doesn't have to say when, and Andrew will sort of talk through that. So don't, don't always assume that you have to have a date, a fixed date that says, you know, on the 31st of June, we're going to retire that application, and that's a roadmap. Well, no, that actually might be a life cycle, and that might already be um, a more complicated or a more advanced roadmap than you needed necessarily. Okay, but a life cycle is definitely something that plays in this field, and even TOGAF uh, um, has some sort of conversations about what is the difference between a life cycle and a, and a roadmap. Now, algorithms is, is the, the topic of today, and, and how you're going to use algorithms to empower these roadmaps. So fundamentally, algorithms to us, and, and we've presented on this before, so, so don't get me wrong, um, this isn't the first time we've, we've done an open group webinar about what are algorithms, so that's not really what we're going to do today. Um, I can send you the deck on those if you, if you drop me a note, our contact details are at the end. But we've got lots of, lots of um, kind of um, positions on, on what algorithms are in their own right, but fundamentally for the purpose of today, they're really just something that can come up with these measures, you know, come up with these numbers and, and give you some quantitative insight that you may not have otherwise had. Now, if you've got numbers, hopefully you're not just going to stare at some you know, spreadsheet or some you know, table of, of numbers, you're going to want to visualize that. Again, we've done lots of presentations about different techniques for data visualization, but basically there's any number of charts that you can use to visualize a roadmap. Okay, so don't instantly presume a Gantt chart, which is of course something we'll talk about, um, is the only way you can do roadmaps. And again, Andrew will show you some examples of, of roadmaps using charting techniques that aren't actually a Gantt chart, so that's fine. Um, and ultimately, um, I guess it needs to be appreciated, and, and don't worry, I'm a big supporter of, of the Open Group and their standards, but um, they only go so far. So neither TOGAF nor Archimate have any concept of algorithms um, in them. They don't, of course, tell you how you should do cost analysis. They don't tell you how you should do risk analysis. Um, they have some sort of you know, qualitative statements around that, but they don't have the explicit algorithms. And indeed, they don't have any charts. You know, they don't even say you should do a Gantt chart, right? They don't have anything like that. Um, Archimate itself, actually, out of the box, doesn't even have any metrics or properties at all. 
So all of that stuff is a, um, is some sort of addition you're going to need to do to the out-of-the-box standards. We, of course, have, have done this you know, enough times and we've got you know, TOGAF Plus and Archimate Plus where they're, they're you know, obviously configured with all the useful things that you can do um, after that. But needless to say, from the pure standards point of view, um, they, do, they do take you pretty close, but they don't give you the full answer. Um, so yep, a word on on both the standards. I mean, obviously, Togo, I'm sorry, the Open Group has many, many standards. Um, but the two, you know, that we we are near and dear to our hearts in in the architecture profession is Archimate and Togaf, of course. Um, so yeah, don't don't think that they're the silver bullet. I mean, I know there's you know hundreds and hundreds of pages there, and and they've got lots of you know really amazing content in them. See them as like a toolbox. You know, it's it's essentially the you know the the thing you have on your hip that you can you know dip into. Um, the way I usually talk about TOGAF is you know if you know it's a keyword thing. If you if you can't find the keyword in the TOGAF document, it's probably not relevant to architecture. So you know, use that control F and, and try and find the thing you're looking for. It's absolutely going to have something to say about it, whether it's stakeholder management, whether it's gap analysis, you know, whether it's um, obviously baseline target architectures. All those things are in there and they get a look in. Okay, so it'll be in there, um, but look at it as a bit of a toolbox, you know, and a bit of a starter for ten. Uh, yeah, sorry, I know that's an English phrase um, from University Challenge, but anyway, look at it as a bit of a starting place for you um, to go on and do your work. Um, now, a bit, of a bit of a pitch, I mean, Abacus itself, our product is certainly certified to support both TOGAF 9.2 and Archimate 3.0.1. Um, so that's fine. So of course, you can use our, um, Abacus to be able to get started with this stuff and it's you know, pre-configured with all the things you might need. But yeah, we, we don't really want to do a, a tool pitch here. It's more the, the theory and the concepts behind what you can do. Okay. Right. So again, keyword. Type the keyword into TOGAF. You'll find the word roadmap in there. Um, there's a whole um, set of different opinions on that within the TOGAF standard itself. Um, so certainly, the thing that that um, TOGAF is pretty pretty precise about is a roadmap is actually a package of things. Okay, they do. do um, as I said before, they do address this concept of the difference between a life cycle and a roadmap. Okay, so a roadmap to TOGAP is certainly something more than just a timeline or a life cycle of things. It's a package of stuff. So it's a collection of what they call work packages, okay, or a portfolio of work packages. Now, work packages, of course, can be projects or programs or tasks, all that kind of stuff. Um, there is a, a whole collection of description around um, you know, gap analysis and transition architectures, so how you get from point A to point B, I and mean, then you guys would know in the, the, the architecture development method, there's a whole set of phases that deal with this, right? You know, how do you actually do that transition from baseline to target? Okay, so that's of course all part of the road mapping world. Now I did say that TOGAF, and neither TOGAF nor Archimate has any charts. Um, it's a bit funny. Um, there, there is actually a thing called a business value assessment matrix, okay, and that's a picture of it on the right. So you know, I love it that it's called a matrix. Now, of course, that's your good old you know two by two um, kind of quadrant thing. You know, it looks a lot like a bubble chart to me. So yeah, look, it does actually have a chart in it. And it's, it's called a business value assessment matrix. We of course talk about it as a as a bubble chart. But yeah, I mean, it's obviously looking at three properties here, or technically four properties here. You know, value versus risk size of the bubbles are then the, the, the cost of the project essentially and the colour is then some statement about um, you know, a recommendation essentially about what we think we should do with that project. Okay, so that is still, you know, I could argue that's a roadmap. You know, it's talking about things we're going to be doing that are in the future. So these are projects. Of course, projects are the transformational part of any business. You know, they're the bits that make it change. So if a business is going to look different in the future and you want to describe how it's going to be um, change, so how you're going to affect that change, that's a list of projects. Okay, That list of projects, just like TOGAF says here, is a work package portfolio. Okay, That is absolutely part of the way of talking about a roadmap, Okay, your project list. Okay, um, it's no, There's no Gantt chart there, there's no when um, these things are going to happen, there's no time in terms of you know, an explicit um, when statement. We're just saying these are the sort of things that are going to be happening over time. Okay, now of course the, the, the green projects are probably the ones that are going to happen and the red ones are the ones that are probably going to be stopped or, or dare I say the orange ones might be the ones that are going to be stopped. So not all of those things are going to necessarily deliver, but they're all in there. Um, I'll, try, I'll try and get through. So needless to say, there are date properties and stuff like that in the TOGAF content meta model framework. Okay, they do have things like you know, when things go into life and out of life. So you can absolutely do your Gantt charts though, just using those properties. That's fine. Um, and ultimately, a roadmap is arguably that first 
iteration or the first draft of what's called the implementation and migration plan, which is of course one of the deliverables that come out of the TOGAF method. Okay, so TOGAF has a pretty strong position on it. Um, that's the, the basic summary there. But yeah, go, go and search for yourself if you need to, to get some good detail. And we've, like I say, we've done presentations before that really go into what a roadmap is according to TOGAF in detail. So. Um, okay, just quickly on Archimate. Um, so remember, um, no charts, okay, um, no algorithms, of course. Um, Archimate really actually only has diagrams. Um, TOGAF has you know, catalogs and matrices too, and arguably one chart, the business value assessment matrix. Um, anyway, Archimate's only got diagrams. Um, so yeah, you can diagrammatically talk about a roadmap here. Archimate has some constructs, of course. They call them plateaus and gaps. Okay, so again, I don't know how much everyone's familiar with all the constructs that are in Archimate, but there are some constructs there. A, a plateau is essentially like an architecture or some point in time. So you could have like a baseline architecture and a target architecture just, show, just like shown in this diagram here. So, so you can certainly define what those things are as objects, okay, and then show how they're um, you know associated with various other things in the um, rest of the the Archimate world. Um, it does have a concept of work packages and projects and deliverables and all that kind of stuff. There are those constructs in there too about how do you affect these things, okay? Um, and it has a specific viewpoint, which is this one that you're looking at here, which is the implementation and migration viewpoint. So diagrammatically, you absolutely in Archimate can start to describe roadmaps like this, but they're very pictorial and they're very, um, dare I say, labour intensive, they're not so quantitative or objective, and out of the box there is certainly no algorithms to apply here about you know whether one um, approach is better than another, what's the difference really between transition and target architecture, you know, is one cheaper, is one you know better, are there multiple architectures you might have gone through you know, as options and stuff like that. There's, there's none of that quantitative side. But nonetheless, there are some constructs there in the way of thinking about Archimate that you can overload, sorry, overlay no code algorithms on top of. Yeah, I might, I might sort of just whip through this one actually. I'm looking at time here. I can see I've taken 20 minutes already. So I don't really need to convince you guys. I'm, I'm sure you, 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 know, you hopefully have appreciated that you know, doing it all in Microsoft Office is pretty tricky. You know, you, it's not really data driven. It's not repository driven. You're more or less reinventing the wheel. You know, if you're going to bash out an Excel spreadsheet, um, this stuff's been done. You know, and it's been done. It's been codified to large degrees in you know, standards like TOGAF and Archimate and of course in tools like ours. So you know, I, I just would counsel you, you know, try not to reinvent the wheel. Um, Hopefully you can even use some of the, 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 the expertise we've got here. If you're going to go and you know, do, it, do it from scratch using something like Excel and you know, PowerPoint and whatever, but um, nonetheless, I, you know, I certainly um, yeah, don't think that's necessary. <laughs> right, so it's all about data. Now I appreciate that some people call it data. Um, I call it data, sorry about that. Um, anyway, data or data, depending on where you're from in the world. Um, and ultimately, you know, thinking of yourself as a, you know, dare I say, a data-driven enterprise. So someone who's using data to, you know, their advantage. It's the, it's the oil. You know, all those metaphors about, you know, how important information is and how important data is. Okay, so um, roadmaps can require a lot of data. So I guess that's part of the, the thing we're hoping to try to explain today is some of that data is manual, some of that data may be human based, but a lot of that data is automatic, a lot of that data can be um, generated using algorithms and things like that, right? So you can spin, you know, you know, looking at out of the box things and manually populated things, you can start to spin that in different ways and come up with new KPIs and new metrics that you never would have had before. Those KPIs can then be seeds into new algorithms. So you've got this whole world of data that's some of it's manual some of it's um, you know harvested you know pulled out of different systems and things like that and absolutely some of it is created and generated using algorithms and things like that but fundamentally it needs to be seen as this you know we're all in this together you know, this is a shared asset that we're all trying to leverage and make the best of um, and we're all busy of course so hopefully um, you know aside from the, the Excel and the you know the kind of reinventing the wheel or doing it from from scratch mentality, you don't need to do this stuff from scratch either. You know, there's been lots of work has been done, certainly by us and by other people, about how you can leverage a data-driven or at least a, a digital representation of an enterprise um, into something that has quantitative value, that you can ask it questions and it'll tell you a quantitative answer. Um, and yeah, fundamentally, you've got to see this as a living, breathing ecosystem of information. 
you know, the way we see it in evolution, again, this is I think the only tool slide we've got really, um, you know, we see there's this stuff that happens, you know, underground. There's all that, you know, that stuff that, you know, the architects do. There's all of that, you know, really good stuff with plugging into, you know, things and harvesting content, you know, using the adapters, using the APIs, all that stuff to build this foundation. You know, it's the roots of this ecosystem. And then, you know, the information flows up from there into the enterprise and obviously it becomes everyone's world and everyone starts co authoring things, they start collaborating, and it just becomes a living, breathing thing that the enterprise uses. And ultimately, these algorithms are something that enhances that. So I, I don't know, I don't, take, don't take the metaphor too far, but it's, you know, it's the smart that really brings it all to life. You know, so while some people might be keying some things in somewhere, that might trigger some algorithm to run, and then fundamentally it may produce some other numbers that some other stakeholder is going to use to help them make some decision. And that all happens. It's all the magic that happens behind the scenes in some algorithmic approach that, that we, of course, advocate. A um, bit of a quick step back, the fundamentals of a roadmap. Okay, you're really just trying to think about, well, where are we now? So you hear a lot of philosophies about um, you know, blue sky thinking, green fields, where we need to just, we don't care where we are now, where we are now is bad, so let's throw that out, let's you know, build some beautiful future and then just try to work out how to get here. I don't believe that. I think you do need to absolutely understand a little bit about where you are now. You then fundamentally do need to work out where you want to get to. Okay, but you shouldn't see those two things in isolation. You should see why and justify why you want to be there. That's fine. And then ultimately a roadmap is, of course, your ability to get from point A to point B. Now, there may be many other forks along the way. So we talk about this as you need to prove that future state or that end point is actually feasible. So you need to prove that it's valid, that it exists, that that is a possible future state. And so there's various algorithms and various ways you can do that and prove that, yeah, if we could get there, that's valid. It will meet the requirements we have. Then you have to prove it's reachable, though. And I notice I'm the guy in the middle there by looks of it, so I'm the ball guy again in the middle. So I'm the guy who's got to get you there, right? So Andrew can you know, help you build it. I'm going to get you there. Um, either way, the... Um, the, the algorithms and all these road mapping concepts need to prove that that beautiful future is not only feasible, it's also reachable. And so a road map really is those steps along the way. So again, back to like TOGAF, it's a portfolio of work packages. It's a set of steps that you need to do and it's just as valuable to show the things you shouldn't do and prove that you shouldn't have done that because that was a bit of a, a rabbit warren or a dead end, but these are the paths that you should take to get there. So that's fundamentally the, the philosophy that we apply. It's not just a you know, beautiful future and how do we get here. It is absolutely an iteration between those two worlds. So I'm fundamentally, and you know Togaf's new retriever method, it's a, an iteration between the target and the baseline and all the transitions or potential transitions in between. Now, that all sounds great. Um, there's been some cool, cool studies over the years um, about yeah, essentially, what's our attention span? So I know, you know, 20 years ago we had a longer attention span than we did five years ago. So you know, all the you know the onset of social media and you know and all the tablets and all that kind of stuff has you know they've done Microsoft did a big study about five years ago that showed that the average attention span has, has unfortunately fallen from 12 to eight seconds. So you know, well, 12 seconds was pretty short. Now it's only eight seconds. That's how long you've got. And you'll be pleased to know that that is actually less than what a goldfish has. <laughs> So that was part of their study. They showed that we even have less attention span than the average goldfish these days. So unfortunately, you know, this is the world we live in. We can't, you know, we don't have the luxury of time as much as a roadmap is all about time. We've got to be clear, we've got to be precise, and we've got to obviously give value very quickly. So yeah, I don't need to really reiterate that, but you know, we don't have time to look at lots of diagrams. We don't have time to, you know, certainly you know, look at hundreds of pictures. You know, the humble pie chart, the humble Gantt chart, the humble bubble chart. You know, that's how decisions are made. We all know that. Okay, so fundamentally, we've got to try and work out how do we make those sort of um, artifacts, as you know, they're called, for the people who need to make decisions. Okay, because they've only got eight seconds <laughs> to make their decision. So it brings us to no code. I'll just give a quick intro to this and I will throw over to Andrew to, to do the detailed kind of walkthrough of you know kind of how the no code stuff you know plays a part. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of no code, I'm sure you've heard of low code. Um, you know, hopefully these are terms that, that I'm not introducing for the first time to you guys. I'm guessing that's why you've joined the, the webinar in the first place. Um, 
So yeah, it's, it's a pretty hot topic. Um, it, we've obviously seen the, the groundswell of it for a few years. We've, we've of course been in this space for many years. Um, fundamentally, it's about trying to democratise the way this stuff is done. Because if you know we're seen as the eggheads in the ivory tower doing that, you know whatever egghead stuff, you know if the architects are seen as that, then we've got to change that perception. You know if those algorithms that we're doing are seen as something that only we are the secret wizards who know how to use it, you know that the trust is not going to be there. Okay. So you know we've got to be you know establishing ourselves as trusted advisors in the companies that we work with. So fundamentally, giving them some transparency and hopefully even getting them to make their own algorithms and their own things, even if it's just a simple formula, it empowers the business to help us um, get information and ultimately make decisions that we all agree on. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen some of the, the latest no-code stuff that's out there. Um, some of you may even recognize some of these screenshots. That, that bottom one is actually a, a package called Scratch. Um, if any of you have kids that are between the age of maybe, I think about seven and ten, this is what they're all learning in school. This came out at MIT. So my eight-year-old son uses Scratch. So he codes, no codes, should I say, in Scratch. Absolutely. So it's block based, it's very visual, it's easy to learn. It does just sort of wrap up all those basic primitives that most of us know from our coding days with you know while loops and for loops and ifs and all that kind of stuff. So all those kind of procedural concepts are embodied in blocks and it's just very easy to do. So absolutely if my eight year old can do it, you know, I'd like to think that any of us can do it. Um, and remember, just the, the positioning of this, these, these no-code algorithms, they're all about trying to help you get from your current state to future state using metrics to guide that process along the way. So whether it's you know, looking at cost, whether it's looking at risk, whether it's looking at you know, who knows what um, metrics that people care about. And I say who knows what because don't forget, this is all about giving the business and you know, anyone who's um, got an opinion on it, a different algorithm, giving them the ability to code those algorithms themselves. Okay? So we in the architecture office, we in the ivory tower, we don't have to actually solve that problem. You know, we just say, look, we've got a digital repository here. You, know, you digitized your business. How do you want to analyze it? Okay, so with that, I will throw to Andrew though and um, he can, yeah, obviously wave this magic, you know, no-code wand over all the different ways that we can roadmap. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Tim. Um, one of the quick comments I saw during the chat was that it seems like my volume is relatively low. So if you do adjust your volume, um, don't worry, you won't have to adjust it back very quickly. I'll be speaking for the next 20 minutes or so. Um, the main um, kind of idea here now is to go through some of the roadmaps, uh, the four roadmaps that we've um, depicted here and show you how we can start using no code to effectively value add to these roadmaps. Now we're not going to be jumping into kind of the core bits or the granular details of these roadmaps and we've certainly done um, a bespoke roadmapping webinar before. Um, so like Tim mentioned earlier on, there's a whole bunch of other WebExes that we can send you links to um, to actually go through those in much more detail. The four styles or types that you can see on here um, effectively incrementally get more detailed. So each style introduces new insights, which inevitably requires additional data to start actually analyzing those roadmaps. But we're going to go through each one and try to apply this no-code spin on each type to show you how we can start leveraging these in a much more effective way. So the first type we have in here is tagging with suggestions and heat maps. Now, heat maps in general um, are effectively just a way of color coding some of the visualizations that you might produce. And what we're effectively trying to show here is that heat maps um, basically give you these key indicators at a glance. So you can see on the right hand side there these kind of color codes that we're applying. And the idea is to start tagging some of these, in this case, capabilities. It could be applications or data or infrastructure within an architecture or an organization just to give some kind of clear direction. Now, it's very really worth pointing out at this stage um, that what we're effectively looking at here is not the, the when or the why or the how. Um, it's essentially just looking at the what. So some kind of strategic content that we're going to be applying around these elements to give some kind of focused decision making. There's a slight caveat here as well, I guess, um, in terms of the suggestions that we might apply according to these elements, in the fact that if we do have some kind of strategic intent to maybe decommission an application 
or introduce or remove existing capabilities. It needs to be that um, additional step in there where you have your target applications or the thing that's going to be replacing effectively what you're effectively decommissioning. You, know, you can guarantee that if we do start replacing things like our CRM system without any kind of replacement, um, then of course that's going to cause headaches throughout the organization and even your customers as well. The effective um, no code slant to being able to produce these kind of type one level roadmaps um, is to remove the kind of traditional approach of guesswork and introduce this capability of being able to start estimating through this kind of um, value based chain that you're seeing on the left hand side here about introducing this no code block based system. You know, it's pretty easy to, to take a look at how we can start dragging and dropping blocks. We're looking at the flow here of information through a graphical interface and effectively trying to make it easy. You know, just as Tim suggested, his eight year olds already doing something very similar. We can also apply the same concepts um, to any kind of architectural work that we're doing as well. The particular example that is actually going through on the page here is looking at all these capabilities that we have, going through all the underlying technology or processes and effectively applying this suggestion to, in this case, this business capability map. Now, it's all well and good being able to produce some kind of tagging mechanism throughout, um, in this case, the capabilities or any other domain. There are various approaches or best practices out there that we can actually start leveraging already to help us understand how we can start driving some of the um, ideas and results around this data. So some of these you've probably heard of before. So this kind of time concept of tolerate, invest, migrate, eliminate is certainly one approach. There's another approach in here as well, which we call four R's. So this, this kind of idea of retain, redesign, refresh, and retire. And the ability to actually start using these values is essentially to get some kind of consistency across the kind of direction or the suggestions that are being driven um, through this data. Now, the previous slide you would have seen in terms of trying to find the suggestions that we can put around capabilities um, can also be spun in terms of things like application portfolio management. Now, all of the inputs into this no code algorithmic approach is perfectly fine and it's actually data driven. So from an APM perspective, if we think of things like business fit of applications, we might be considering you know, how many capabilities is it supporting, I mean, how many users of the application are there, or the cost of the application. And then from a technical perspective, we might also be considering things like tech debt in terms of the waivers we've been issuing against the applications maybe where the applications are deployed, so the various environments they're within, and maybe even how easily maintainable the application is. So you can think of these as inputs to your algorithm to effectively start throwing out these outputs that you can start representing visually then. In terms of the visuals themselves, so you would have seen a couple of visuals we've shown so far. And Tim also mentioned at the beginning, we've, we've done specific WebExes around um, the actual visualizations that are fit for purpose, using the best visualization for the right job. So we'll certainly um, send those through to give you an idea of the type of visualizations that are out there that you can use. But fundamentally, as a no-code approach, and kind of driving some of the suggestions that we have around these areas, you know, to make it a bit clearer, we're not actually talking about kind of rise machines here. It's, it's purely a suggestion. You know, the real work comes from the architects understanding and verifying that suggestion. So, you know, there might be some rationale internally why you might be you know, shifting away from the no-code suggestion, but certainly the idea is to start verifying them. And like I said at the beginning, this is a value-add concept. It's not about taking control away. It's about making things more efficient and making these data-driven um, kind of metrics available to a wider audience, essentially. So type one roadmaps um, certainly is again showing us the what of the tagging implementation approach. But now we actually want to start looking at the when. So we've already got clear direction in terms of what things we're going to be changing. And then to understand the when in terms of timescales, there might be some kind of traditional views that you're familiar with. 
So things like Gantt style charts, you know, these are perfectly fine for defining time scales or critical paths to any projects that are running. However, there is a, both a broader approach we can take to defining the actual strategy. And again, there's the more granular approach to defining time itself, or these time scales, in the form of life cycles. So the life cycles you will see, as we've mentioned here, is almost that bridge between them. And then fundamentally, we can apply a no-code approach to those life cycles as well. Now, working with life cycles in general, you know, at highest level, and it's assumed that most elements within any architecture has a set of life cycles itself. So these could be life cycles on applications, on capabilities, on processes. You, know, you even find life cycles on data itself as well. And from a minimum to kind of maximum return perspective, you, know, you can quite simply start with, very simply, you know, the start and end dates of certain elements. So this can already give us a view, or standard views at least, into the dependencies and end-to-end -end views of our portfolios. Although when we actually look at that a bit further, we can actually take uh, another step in terms of defining life cycles into two basic types. Now, typically, these tend to fall into things that your organization can control. So this is things like product launch dates, you know, internal support for technology, application decommissioning dates. And then the second basic type is things that your organization can't or don't control. So typically these are things like the vendor support dates for technology. Now initially, um, that's something that's relatively complex. Um, there's various tools and resources out there, such as things like Technopedia, um, which are great resources to get started with managing things like lifecycle dates. But additionally, there are also things like compliance and regulatory deadlines that will also need to be adhered to. And again, these are typically the things that are slightly outside of the control of the organization. The image at the bottom that you're actually seeing is this concept then of delving into these kind of richer life cycles that we can produce. So along this, this kind of graph style view, you can see all of these peaks in this image and basically, no code approach allows us to start rolling up and aggregating what may initially seem like advanced, kind of detailed life cycles into these high level views. That's exactly what this no code approach allows us to do is take what is the seemingly complex and roll this up to be usable throughout the organization. There's a really good example of doing that and in terms of managing these life cycles across these various layers that we have. Now, the first thing to reiterate again is that most of the content or the elements that you have in your architectures, you know, they don't typically exist in isolation. You know, they might traditionally in Excel spreadsheets are floating around, but typically you want to try and get all of this into a single area. Now, you know, the pure nature of things like graph databases is that there is this underlying network of connected components. And what you will quickly find is that all of these interdependencies allow this type of impact analysis style view to be generated. The benefit, of course, of doing things like lifecycle management is it does open up the possibility then of utilizing this aggregation technique to start determining life cycles of elements based on their underlying connected components. So you'll actually see on this visualization, we can take this no-code approach. We can take a look at a server, for example, and we can actually determine the lifecycle dates of the server purely based on all of the technology that's underpinning that particular server. Now, this is an infrastructure example, but you can apply this across any domain, you know, project-based, program-based, application-based, and it's a really useful way of starting to aggregate these dates up. Now, there's a whole area in terms of machine learning and kind of filling in the blanks for various attributes that you might be capturing. But from a life cycles perspective, this is absolutely one of the ways that um, it's, it's certainly going to be helpful to understand these interdependencies across your entire architecture. That leads on to um, what we typically call a type three roadmap. Now, everything we've kind of gone through so far, so type one and type two, is a basically an idea of what's going to be changing, when it's going to be changing, but now we actually need to start introducing how that change is going to be put into effect. 
Now, to develop a plan to start communicating this, you know, there's a, there's a brief definition here from, from TOGAF in terms of how they define work packages. You know, thinking of it as you know, any set of activities, whether it's granular or complete programs, the scale itself you know, isn't too important here. The main objective is to actually just understand you know, how do we get from where we are now to where we want to be in you know, three, six, or 12 months' time. And that's exactly what these work packages help um, anyone who's working across roadmaps to start developing both from a kind of complete project view to program views to essentially encapsulating everything within the architecture. Now, modeling work packages themselves, again, Tim's gone over something similar in previous slides about how Agme and TOGAF support these concepts. Um, but essentially, you're trying to think of these work packages um, as a form of transforming from one state to another. So, you know, the visual aspect of this you know, does vary across notations and methodologies as well. So TOGAF certainly then subscribes to the idea of using catalogs and matrices to start leveraging some of these areas around work packages. You know, Archimate itself, on the other hand, does actually help with being slightly more prescriptive. So, you know, concepts such as gaps and plateaus help you start planning and developing these ideas. But there is a fundamental kind of lineage through all of these, and the key aspects of that is to get some kind of clear understanding of how to move forward, you know, how we can move from where we are now to where we want to be, and then actually understanding the conflict then between these work packages. You know, as I mentioned, nothing really exists in silos. These work packages will absolutely be you know, bouncing off each other. They'll be changing the same thing. And so these conflicts are you know, notoriously difficult to start managing and understanding. But certainly some of the views that you can produce here will help leverage some of that. Now, the additional benefit of using an algorithm-based approach is that we can actually start cascading dates across and throughout the architecture. If projects are certainly changing various aspects and elements, or there's some kind of stop-start process to a project, this has an entire ripple effect throughout your entire architectural views. You know, if we change one project, it probably will be impacting something else. And the idea for these work packages is try and understand how all of that fits together. And this no-code approach helps you understand that in much more detail. Now, identifying the work package impacts, we've talked about interdependencies and how they might be conflicting with each other. You know, this is effectively this algorithm tactic that we can start leveraging. And we've talked about interdependencies and you know, changes to projects, but effectively this no-code approach shouldn't really be stopped there. You know, it can open a whole bunch of other doors and a whole bunch of other possibilities and possible metrics you know, that might have been previously quite difficult to understand and what might not have been traditionally um, used in a standard roadmap style. So if you consider the visualization that's actually um, flowing through here, it's actually showing the various projects um, within this typical organization. And it's actually drilling down into these areas and looking at what areas it's actually impacting or changing. So you know, be it technology it's retiring, um, you know, applications it's migrating, new capabilities it's introducing, these are all the interdependencies now between these projects or programs across the rest of the architecture. That also means that we can analyze some other things, so things like scheduling projects and programs to run concurrently or sequentially, you know, based on what they're actually changing. And maybe whether each program has the right amount of resources allocated to it. So you might have a, a view of the, the current available resources and any future plans to increase capacity. And of course, things like the criticality of the programs and the scale of changes that are actually being made. You know, all of this can be driven through this no-code approach. Now, all the metrics that we, we kind of talk about through these slides um, do vary, but they flow into the notion of then comparing what we typically call this optimal solution. Now, these optimal solutions effectively lead us on to this fourth type and final type of roadmap. Now, a multiple architectures-based view is essentially the ability to start analyzing different states or different scenarios. So it's certainly not a new concept. You know, TOGAF already prescribed things like baseline, target, and various transition architectures. But architectures are that main artifact we're using to manage all of this data. 
you know, as much as you, you've probably heard the word a thousand times now, but it's essentially that there is some kind of single source of truth, you know, a core hub here that maintains this consistency across any roadmap that we actually produce. All of the content, or certainly most of the other roadmaps that have been um, shown during these slides, are typically done within um, a single architecture. But that doesn't mean we can't start modeling these different states as physically different architectures and different states in time. And by moving these out into completely separate architectures, it means we can actually start analyzing different methods here as well. You know, this is exactly what it falls into from a TOGAF perspective, and it basically forms the implementation and migration plan. The other concept here as well is that we start looking at all of this content and all of the various stages of the architectures and different physical states in time and pass this off through some kind of trade-off analysis. Again, it's something that's covered extensively throughout various reference architectures, and including TOGAF, and it's a, certainly a well-trodden path through that entire methodology. The main benefit you have here, and we're using this kind of performance word to describe the architectures. You know, how well are these architectures performing? So this trade-off analysis of these multiple architectures um, is obviously going to be um, based on this no-code approach, and that's where you get the maximum utilization out of these. Multiple architectures in its own right is, you know, it's a pretty solid concept in terms of what it can achieve, but overlaying this algorithmic approach means we can start analyzing the overall performance of each architecture and effectively apply a score to each one. So far, what we've been looking at here is actually looking at the underlying score for individual elements. Now we're actually rolling all of this up to the architectural level. So we can start aggregating these KPIs to this top level view. That exact comparison is basically what we're showing on the right hand side. You know, on the axes here, we're showing these different scores that are calculated, and on a whole scale architecture analysis point of view, these are some of the, the standard uh, metrics that might be captured, but of course, you choose which metrics that you're interested in at the time. Now, comparing architectures obviously is, is a good example in here, and some of the options that you might have, for example, are things like, you, know, you might have couple of options for architectures where you decide a high level surface um, is certainly something that's achievable in option A, but then it introduces a larger implementation cost. Whereas you know, option B, which seems to give us an edge around business growth, might actually be lagging behind slightly in the time of completion that we had in mind. And it's this trade-off analysis that we can run to actually understand what the best possible options are for us. Now the options themselves, you know, it's not really the end of the road there. It's, it's one of the common concepts throughout Turkoff as well, where we start actually talking about this being an iterative process. You know, when we actually think we've reached the end, there's always scope to go back for further optimization. You know, there are new avenues to start exploring. There's more advanced no-code approaches we can provide. And all of this essentially leads to this higher level of confidence in the actual outputs. Now, one final thing to mention before I pass back to Tim and you guys can turn your volume down, um, is that all the algorithms that we've seen so far and, and generically all the algorithms that are out there you know, have the tendency to be viewed as something that simply pulls in data and spits data back out. You know, so hopefully what we've actually tried to show here with these views across roadmap styles is that there's some shift in that mentality to show that you know, algorithms don't only provide additional numbers. They can provide direction and advice at the element level, but more importantly, what we've seen here is it provides direction and advice at that entire architectural level as well. On that, I will pass you back over to Tim, um, and he will be going through the next couple of slides in here then. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, give you a second to turn your volumes down, yes, if, if you've turned them up. Um, I must have my microphone stuffed closer to my, my mouth. Um, yeah, look, so we've only got a handful of minutes left. I've tried my best in the, the Q&A section there to, to, to just quickly answer some of the questions because I sort of could predict that we might run out of time. So still put some in there. We might get some time at the end if you've got a chance. Um, so Francis, I'm sorry, your question up there in the chat, I'm not going to get a chance to, to respond to that in text here. But if we get some time at the end, I can I can try that. 
So yeah, absolutely. Um, Andrew's gone through, you know, giving us a bit of a, you know, a quick kind of um, out of the possible on, on you know, using algorithms or no-code algorithms to augment the way that roadmaps are all made, so that they have some quantitative rigor to them, and that they can be hopefully more reliable and more defensible. But where do we start? You know, I sort of said, well, you know, what do you do on Monday morning? You know, you go, great, Tim's and Andrew have shown me all these cool stuff, but you know, what on earth do I do? And you know, these are um, you know, the fundamental heart of what we try to do as architects. Okay? So it's a complicated problem. So not surprisingly, TOGAP's got something to say about that as well, and we'll come to that. Um, there, there was this sort of famous line, um, I know Desmond Tutu was someone who repeated it, but it's older than that, which was, you know, how do you eat an elephant, you know, one bite at a time. So, so decomposition, we know that as architects, it's fundamentally how we have to do this, we have to break these big problems into their smaller parts, okay. Um, there are, um, dare I say, tensions that, that work against this, okay. So as soon as you start to split things up, well, how do you know who's right? Okay, because you know there's differing opinions. There'll be conflicts between you know someone says you know we need to go this way and someone else says we need to go that way. Okay, so you're always going to as soon as you start to break a problem into its parts, you now have the challenge of of you know reaggregating the the findings again. So that's certainly a challenge, um, and, and we work in that every day in our architecture um, practice as a you know managing all the stakeholders that we have, right? Um, and then fundamentally, um, everyone wants to be working on this at the same time. So who's got the source of truth? I know Andrew used that dreaded term, and, and I have now. But you know, where do you go? How, how do you know what is the, the latest and the best? You know, so so we often talk about that as currency. You know, how current is the information you're using? You know, because obviously if you're working off da bad old data, well, any of your findings are going to be completely garbage. Um, so there is this whole challenge of you know of modularizing or segmenting. Um, an architecture, or dare I say, an approach. Now, there are many approaches. So I know that we're we're here in the open group, and we've got obviously um, at least two approaches there. You know, Togaf and Archimate. Um, there's many more than that. One of the ways we've tried to look at all this, though, is is um, we, we sort of refer to this as a Goldilocks zone. We've we've presented on this before. So when you're trying to choose different um, approaches, one of the useful sort of categorizations we've used is essentially how kind of relationship centric versus entity centric. So you know how many components versus connections or objects versus um, relations or boxes versus lines um, does a different approach advocate. Okay, we've found that these things need to be pretty balanced. Okay, a good approach is one that treats either of these things equally. Now, that's one of the first tenets of architecture: is that you know connections are first order entities. You know, they're equally as important as components. So, there's any number of things. You know, I could kind of wax on about that for an hour. Um, as an architecture 101, but the Goldilocks zone doesn't think you should have an overly verbose. Um, meta model, so you know, a heterogeneous meta model, right? You should still have a pretty balanced one, so an even number of um, relationships versus entities, and that gives you that main diagonal. And then you can see off to the side here, if you've got too many entities relative to the relationships, we often refer to that as an overloaded. It's an object-centric way of thinking, an entity-centric way of thinking. Okay. Um, now the flip side of that are ones that are over precise, where they have you know far more different relationships between um, the entity types. So you know between two given entity types, there might be five different relationships they have, right? So so they're more what we refer to as over precise. So if we start throwing some of the standards up there, TOGAF is, is dead smack bang in the bottom left of the Goldilocks zone. It's got about 40, I think, or 35 to 40 um, entity types. Some of the other ones you're seeing throwing up there, and I, I, I'm not allowed to name them, the whole you know, um, he who should not be named set of um, standards, but there's another one there, Archimate. Now, it shouldn't be a surprise that Archimate came out of, because Archimate came out of UML, which fundamentally is an object-based way of thinking, Archimate's pretty overloaded. Okay, when you look at the actual meta model, there's far more um, component types, entity types, than there are connection types. So, you know, when you look at the verbs, you know, kind of everything, you know, the good old associated with, you know, that, that, you know it's a bit of a throwaway that's there. You know, so unfortunately, um, there is a bit of work to be done, um, I think, in Archimate to make it a balanced meta model. But nonetheless, it's it's the best we got. Well, it's certainly up there with with things like Togaf. But it's a good way of thinking about it, right? So you've got lots of different approaches you can follow, but I, I will always push people in the direction of TOGAP if they're agnostic and they want some guidance about what they should do. Now, the danger there is what we refer to as the Franken model. So I, I, I can see times against me here, so I won't go into this too much, but basically the problem you have if you start building a hybrid 
is you might have you know the left arm is different to the right arm is different to the left leg the right leg and how do these things all work together in a holistic way okay we always talk about you know some you know architecture by itself you know definition wise is the whole is greater than the parts so if you end up fragmenting this too much and making you know all these different stakeholders every stakeholders you know way of thinking ends up you know being in there you end up with just a real you know quagmire of a of, of a way of thinking and no one has that holistic view which is fundamental to our value as architects is to think end to end top to bottom left to right however you want to think about it so again just be careful you don't end up with a franken franken model way of thinking now I said TOGAF is really prescriptive about this. There's a whole chapter on it about how do you partition. So again, I won't go into this too much. We've definitely done um, presentations about this in the past. Um, so there's a lot of guidance there about how do you eat this element, you know, one bite at a time. That recency is a really important factor, though. Is you know how much can you trust the data that you're using with? Okay, and that's fundamentally one of the criteria you should use about partitioning, right? And obviously, you know, getting a good quality uh, result from the information that you have. Um, so yep, just wrapping up, um, obviously we've gone through these four different approaches, um, Andrew's walked you through those with a no-code flavour and hopefully we've sort of started to show you how you can use these algorithms and you know, whether they're you know, in a spreadsheet or however you want to do them, I don't really mind, but of course when it's no-code it becomes a lot more democratised and, and you essentially what we see, and I know this is one of the questions in the chat, um, the way we see it is that you tend, to, you tend to have an architect who does sit alongside a business stakeholder because there's a reasonable amount of understanding of the, the structure of the repository or the structure of the way you describe your business that's inside the architect's heads. You know, they know the meta model, right? They know how things are interconnected. They know what properties exist. They know how things are structured. But they can sit alongside a business um, stakeholder and compose an algorithm on the fly. Okay, that's what we see happen. We see them sit there and go, okay, how do you want to make an assessment about the capabilities? Okay, what's, you know, let's look at two dimensions, this versus that. Okay, well, we could use this property. We could grab this one from there. We could, you know, you're doing all that on the fly and composing a, a score right there and then with a business stakeholder. So, of course, once they've seen and been part of the development of that algorithm, they have a much greater confidence in the result that's coming out of it. Now, you've got George Box's line, you know, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Now that applies to algorithms, right? All algorithms are wrong. Some of them are useful, which goes back to Andrew's point about, and I know you use the word rise of the machines. Um, these things are just suggestions. You've got to see it that way. You've got to see that the architect's role, you know, we, we definitely just see it now and certainly going forward, is taking each of these data points they get, you know, some of them from you know, different subjective approaches, but many of them hopefully from these objective approaches, synthesizing that into making a decision which ultimately becomes the recommendation. Okay, the algorithms are not necessarily going to give you the answer, they're just one piece of the puzzle. And with that, I know we're on time, so um, any of you who are in Dublin next month, um, we'll be there, so, so absolutely we can, we can have some chats there. You've got Andrew's contact details there and, and our website, so obviously drop, drop Andrew a line. Um, you'll get these slides, as Simon said, um, um, drop, drop a note to either Andrew or to Simon, we can give you the slides. I think it's being recorded, it'll end up on the, the Open Group's website. I know in a few days it takes to, to kind of encode that. Um, we can distribute the, the, I think we will have a recording as well, so drop us a note as well. And basically, yeah, last thing to say, thank you for your time. I see it's top of the hour and we don't have time for questions by the looks of it. <laughs> That's great, Tim. That's great. Thank you, Andrew, for your time. Um, as uh, Tim said, there have been some requests for slides please feel free to send me an email and I'll have to go between now. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on a future um, webinar from the Oak Group. So thank you, Tim. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Bye-bye.